happy solstice to you here on Color Quest. I am Margaret Bird, and it is summertime, or so the calendar tells us. Behind me, you will see some plants that I started in the springtime indoors for dye purposes, and I've struggled a bit to keep them flourishing in this extremely wet spring that we've had here in the Pacific Northwest. Today, I'd like to look at one of the flowers that I have attempted to grow. They are hanging on barely, but this is a flower that I learned about last year while I was traveling in the Netherlands, and that is the safflower. Now, the safflower holds some secrets, and that is that it can become two very distinct colors, yellow and a vibrant pink. So join me as we sample some safflower, not from my garden, and test out how we can pull these two beautiful colors from this very unique dye flower. So last year when I bumped into this super cool flower called safflower, I had no idea about how it would work in a dye scenario. I sampled that flower from a garden and then proceeded to use it in a hammer pounding echoprint technique. I have that video here that you can go back and watch from last summer. However, I only learned after I came back that the safflower has been used for centuries as a dye flower. Now, the safflower that I grew in this spring has been having a tough time, and that is because it's been so rainy. So I'm gonna show you right now what is left of the safflower between the rain and the insect friends. I think I have snails and whatnot that are enjoying the tasty treats of the leaves here. A lot of my other plants are also struggling, but some are doing quite well actually, and we'll have to look at those later this year. However, let me turn you around and show you what's going on with the safflower, and then we'll move inside and have to use some safflower that I actually purchased. So I wouldn't know necessarily that these are safflower, except that this is the sign that we put in when we planted these. And you can see that they are hanging on, but I don't think they have enjoyed the amount of rain that we've had. And because I potted them up into these paper style pots I think they've just been really extra saturated with water but I'm gonna plant them up one more time take them out of this and then maybe if we get some summer here we will see some safflower in the dye garden this year so you know that I love to forage for color but sometimes the dye plants that you might want to try are not growing locally to you. So where are you going to get them? Well, as you've seen in many videos here, I actually love purchasing dye resources from a company called Botanical Colors. They happen to be local here to the Seattle area but they have an online shop and I will supplement my dye colors as well as be able to purchase different supplies like mordants, which as you know, are critically important. So when I got back last year after having seen the safflower as a flower, and I even actually tested it out in a sun tea because I had some excess left over after doing the hammer print and I became very curious about it and wanted to do some more experimentation. So I purchased 
safflower petals from botanical colors now one thing that i love about botanical colors also is that they have a wealth of information on their website so if you purchase from them or not but you want to learn a little bit more you can go to their how to section which gives a lot of information about some of their natural dye matter that they sell and safflower is one of them so i'm actually going to follow the instructions that botanical colors has given and see if i'm successful in extracting both the yellow and the pink now looking back last year the pound that i did gave me a yellow and i did get a slightly pinkish color along with some pretty vibrant yellow when i did the sun tea so let's talk a little bit about the differences and how we're going to treat the petals in order to get these two colors so any guesses why this particular plant would have two different colors if you've been watching here you know that something that we look at in several videos is the pH content of our dye because some dye matter is pH sensitive and guess what safflower is one of them so that is what we're going to be using today as the way to shift the color from yellow to pink now there are a couple of differences that we're also going to have to be cautious about and this is where I have stumbled perhaps in some of my exploration or experimenting with safflower number one is the yellow is okay with heat so although we're going to extract it with a cold extraction to begin we're going to be able to use heat in order to work with our different fibers the pink however is sensitive to heat so we're going to have to work with that particular color in a cold environment so because of this difference we are going to be limited in which fibers we can use when we're using the pink state and that is because wool actually needs heat or prefers heat in order for there to be a bond so with this particular dye when it's pink we're probably not going to be able to get that color to adhere to wool so the yellow however we can use all of the fibers now another super interesting difference that i find is that the yellow is going to need us to make sure that our fibers are mordanted however the pink does not require the fiber to be pre-treated with a mordant that's an interesting difference always a good idea to have your fibers pre-treated with a mordant regardless maybe though if you're limited in your ability to have access to heat for your dye or you don't have access to mordant your fiber maybe pink's the way to go now the other thing we talk a lot about is the weight of fiber or the ratio between the dye matter and the fiber itself safflower likes a one-to-one -one ratio or a hundred percent weight of fiber now you can imagine that the petals are quite light so the amount of fiber that you can get the richest colors from is going to be limited unless you have a lot of safflower so today i'm going to work with some very light fiber i don't have a lot of safflower petals and i'm going to have to measure them because i want to make sure that i'm going to have the best chance to get some deep colors using this dye flower so with safflower when i purchased it i got 40 grams which means if i'm going to stick to a one to one ratio i would only be able to dye approximately 40 grams of fiber now i've already sampled some of this so i don't know exactly how much safflower i have nor do i want to actually use the whole bag so i'm going to weigh out the amount that i have based upon the fiber that i have now 
just for ease, I'm going to be doing two pieces of cotton today. I'm going to be measuring how much this cotton weighs, and then I will match that at a one-to-one -one ratio with a safflower. Now, you can go up to 200% of the weight of fiber, so we could double the amount of safflower that we're going to use to the weight of the fiber. However, again, since I'm limited in my weight here, I'm not going to do that. You can also go lighter. Just know that if you do less than a one-to-one -one ratio, you will get eight lighter colors here. So let's go ahead and weigh this fiber. I'm gonna leave it in grams, and I'm going to have two pieces. One that I'm going to weigh, this is gonna be yellow, and then this will be for the pink. I will also do some sample pieces in some other fibers, but for these two, I wanna see what I'm gonna get with these two pieces of cotton. I'm at 26 grams, so now I'm going to weigh the safflower at the same. I'll do one to one. So let's do that next. You can see that they're so light, and you know it doesn't have to be exact, but just roughly, we'll go one to one. There we go, I'm gonna call it a day at that. I still have a decent amount of flowers left over, so I can definitely dye something in the future with that. So the first color we're going to make is the yellow. We're gonna do it with a cold extraction. Even though it can handle heat, we're going to be putting the flower petals into the dye pot with water, and we're just gonna let them soak overnight. Magically, the yellow should be appearing from the petals first. So I filled this up just about halfway, and you can already see some of the yellow coming out of the flowers. So I will let these sit overnight to extract the yellow. So I do want to share something with you. I had to go back and look at the videos in order to recall exactly what I got in terms of color because I have a memory of it not working in terms of me being able to pull the pink. So looking back to see the sun tea that brought a little bit of pink to one of the cotton ribbons is kind of cool. The other ribbons were extremely yellow and vibrant. And I remember that when I tried to shift it, it didn't work when I tested it on some small samples. So I am going to be super cautious in following the instructions and also keeping an open mind, knowing that, as I've said a million times here, sometimes things don't work the way we expect and that shouldn't stop us from trying again or welcoming what it is that nature chooses to provide us at the time. So let's see if pink's going to join us in this video as well. Now, although we don't need to pre-treat our fiber with a mordant for the pink color, as I mentioned, I'm gonna be using fiber that's already been pre-treated regardless for both the yellow and the pink. Now, the cotton that I have here has been pre-treated with aluminum acetate. I'm not gonna show you that process here. There are a few videos about that in the library, but it is, let's say, strongest mordant that you can use for cotton. And I chose to do a huge batch of these cotton pieces so that I would have this wonderful inventory to be able to use with you. So I'm going to use that on both. Now, the other thing is that I'm going to use some sample pieces, little tiny pieces like I normally do, with some of the other fibers. Some pre-treated with soy milk, and I think I'll throw in some without, just to see what happens, see if we see a difference. It doesn't always work out the way that you plan or that you think. So we'll see if there's a difference in the pink with a pre-treated mortar piece versus a non. I'll go ahead and throw in all my little bits just like I normally do. I will not be using wool for the yellow. I've decided that we'll just let wool go since it's not recommended for the pink color. But we will try some different cottons and silk that has been treated both with and without a mordant. See what we get? 
All right, next day. I have squeezed out as much of the dye from the petals and then put the petals in a new pot. This is where I'm gonna be making the pink dye. The yellow dye is now on the stove and I'm going to be putting my wet fiber, as always, into that dye pot for about 45 minutes to an hour at a simmer. And that'll be how we dye the yellow. So making the pink involves a pH shift. We are going to be working with 10% the weight of the petals, which as you recall was 26 grams of soda ash, which is going to make our dye alkaline. And that is where the shift will come. Now soda ash is something you can buy or you can make it at home. It's super easy to make and that is by taking baking soda and heating it in an oven for a few hours at a very low temperature, like 200 degrees Fahrenheit. And that will change the content enough to where it will be considered soda ash. So we will go ahead and measure that off at 10%. So I'm going to be looking to have about 2.6 grams of soda ash. I'm not too concerned about precision, as you know, and my scale doesn't work in those half numbers in the gram section. So I'll go somewhere between two and three and call it a day at that. These stuff here in my homemade soda ash. You can follow a recipe and see me make soda ash in a video here from the Aruba vlog about a year and a half ago now where I made soda ash to shift the aloe vera. So if you look for the aloe vera film, you'll be able to see it. All right, let's measure this out. We want to get to between two and three grams here. There's three. We will be placing this into the dye pot with the safflower petals that we used. I'm gonna add water to turn this into an alkaline bath. Now we're just gonna let that sit for about two hours and that should be leaching out the rest of the dye into an alkaline bath that will make it pink. We'll see. <laughs> I'm going to trust that that's going to work and if not, well, well, nothing ventured, nothing gained. It has been a few hours since the safflower petals have been sitting in the alkaline bath of soda ash and I was expecting there to be this shift that I could see. And in fact, the color doesn't look that different from the yellow. However, I took the next step by looking at the two different dyes side by side and doing the final step, which is the neutralization step. And that is going to be adding 10% of the weight of petals. So again, about 2.6 grams of citric acid, or in this case, lemon juice, in order to neutralize the pH. And guess what? Something magical happened. Pink emerged. So I wanna quickly show you that just as an example, and then we'll do the same to the full dye pot and put our fibers in for soaking. So here is the petal in the alkaline bath and it's been soaking for quite some time. And if I go in to the bath without straining, you can see the color. I guess it looks a little bit more orange than yellow. I'm gonna put it right here next to the yellow dye. So here they are side by side. This was the yellow dye. It's actually after heating. 
so that can shift the color a little bit and then this is what I just took out and that's in the alkaline bath now I have read that you do not want this to go above 11 so if you have pH test strips, you can test this, and I did that, and it looked like it was between 10 and 11, so I just left it as is. You know, it doesn't really look pink, but I was curious and thought I'd test it out first this way by adding a tiny bit of citric acid, i.e. lemon juice, and this really cool thing happens. So this is going to bring the pH back down. Check that out. It is turning much more pink. So definitely this neutralization is what brings back out the pink. So now you can see the difference. It's pretty significant. That really does show you that that neutralization step is critically important. Now, as with most things, you will find different recipes on how to work with safflower. So in doing research for this video, I have found some other fantastic resources that have a slightly different way of extracting. And it's worth doing some experimentation and seeing which way might work best for you. I'm not going to show it here, but know that you can find other ways all around the same idea of taking the petals to a pH in the alkaline state of 11 and then back down to a neutral state, probably somewhere around six or seven using citric acid but you may find ways in which the extraction has a lot more soaks involved and that the petals themselves are only introduced into an alkaline bath after trying to leach out as much yellow as possible. So I'm only telling you that because as I playing around more and more with safflower, I see that it is delicate and different kind of dye flower that certainly is worth a lot more exploring and experimentation. Oh yeah, and one more thing. Yesterday, when I was working extracting, I wore gloves. It was recommended because it can stain your skin. Today, I didn't use gloves and I definitely have a yellowish tint to my fingers. So if you wanna avoid that, wear gloves. I'm gonna do that now to take out the safflower petals from the alkaline bath before I put in the citric acid. So as you've seen, I've tried, I think about, well, three different dips in the citric acid between two and three and the last one I actually did four grams. And I've been slowly adding it because I can tell by the color that it's not quite back to a neutral state. So I'm gonna test it now. I'm trying to get back to like a six, seven. Seven is absolute neutral and have it be in that state in hopes that it will be pink in the dye bath. Great lesson in, again, trial and error, test it out. Things aren't always gonna go the way it's planned or in the recipe, as you would with baking or any cooking, you might adjust things. So that's exactly what I'm doing. Here's my pH strip. You saw that I was 
in the sort of 10 range, didn't quite get up to 11 in the alkaline bath. I would have had to add more of the soda ash, which I did not do. But let's see where we're at now after adding all of these. We'll just take a quick dip and then bring it down here and see. Let's say we're, I don't know, maybe eight, not seven. Seven would be neutral. So I'm guessing we're about at eight, kind of close to nine. So actually, I'm going to need to add some more citric acid to this. So we'll do a couple more rounds of that, see if we can get it closer to the seven, six-ish realm. Mm -hmm. can still add some more. Feels like it's getting there. Gosh. Interesting. It's definitely needing more than 10% of the weight of petals. Not quite sure why that is. Why it's taking so much citric acid to get back. Let's add some more. By the way, check out that ring. That is definitely pink. So interesting. This is seriously a chemistry experiment, I'm telling you. All right, this is the last time I'm gonna add. If I were doing this not on film, I would just be adding the citric and not worrying about measuring it, but I figured it was worth following the path with you here so you could see just how much experimentation it may take. So I think I'm going to stop it there. Oop, check that out. I think we got ourselves down to seven. Definitely getting very close to seven, somewhere there. So I'm gonna call it, I'm gonna stop it there. And it's time to put our fiber into the dye pot. I have it here already wet, it's been soaking. Remember the pink has to be cold, you do not heat the pink at all. So we'll just go ahead and put this right in to the dye pot and see what we get. We'll let that soak for a couple of hours at least. It could soak overnight. I'll see how my timing goes. I'm also gonna be throwing in those other pieces of fiber, the smaller pieces here. Just throw those pieces in as well. Some of which don't have a mordant and some do just because. But the idea is that this does not need a mordant. So let's let that soak and see what we get. Okay, it's only been in for just a minute or two and I can already see it. It's pink. Look at that. Oh, it's so magical. Who doesn't love natural dyeing? Oh my gosh, gorgeous.
Wow, that's really all I have to say. I mean, that pink speaks for itself. What a vibrant color. I think I've only achieved something similar to that using cochineal, which we will eventually look at here on Color Quest. Such a great dye source. But Safflower, he really threw me for a very sweet loop this time. And I feel really kind of stoked that it worked well. That's what happens when you actually follow directions. <laughs> I know sometimes I go a little too quickly and might skip over some important steps. In any event, I wish you well with safflower. If you grow it in your garden, amazing. Remember, you can do what we did here in today's video. You can also use it as a wonderful plant for echo printing. And I made sun dye with it as well. So pretty versatile, beautiful flower as well, just to have in a vase. So keep your eyes out for it. Now, next week on Color Quest, I'm all pumped up around this pink color and some additional dye sources that I have had to purchase. And I would like to start looking at some that come from trees. So next week, we'll start looking at those with sappinwood. I've never dyed with it. So I'm super excited to see the colors in the red and pink families that sap and wood will bring to us. Remember that down below in the description, I have a series of offerings that I provide here, some of which are free resources that you can download and others that are paid. And that includes a digital course as well as some products or let's say art that I have created all with natural color. So take a look down there if you haven't before. And as always, any support that you send my way is always greatly appreciated. Have a great week and I'll see you next Friday.